Good morning. Welcome to DevOps. Um, we've got a few different things going on this morning. We want to talk about how to implement microservices with Jakarta EE and a microprofile. We're going to kind of split up the presentation. I'm going to introduce you to both topics. We don't know exactly what everyone's background is and how familiar you are with the different technologies. So we're first going to start with a little overview of MicroProfile and Jakarta EE, get everybody on the same page, and then we'll take a little break. And then when we come back, then uh, Ivar is going to be doing more of the demo and walking you through actual code and how you can implement microservices with Jakarta EE or Java EE for now and MicroProfile and using multiple uh, application servers in process. So I did want to put this up. This is our abstract and we're covering that pretty much like what, how we wanted to. The, the only thing is at the very bottom, we said that we would try to demo some aspects of Jakarta EE and we still, we, we, we aren't quite there yet. We've, we're getting very close to having real code out in Jakarta. I mean, we do have the code out there, but to be able to demonstrate the testing and the building of it, we're still working through that process. So we don't have a whole lot directly related to Jakarta EE, but you'll see how it relates to Java EE as we go in. So we first want to introduce ourselves and I'll do it first and then Ivar will do second. So I'm based out of Rochester, Minnesota. I've been with IBM for, I'll just say, a long time. I've been involved with Java EE technologies um, basically since it started, um, working on different technologies with JCA, EJBs, JPA, working up to being the Java EE architect at IBM, and then taking over or being the lead for MicroProfile from IBM, and now I'm driving the Jakarta EE work at IBM. So one thing I found out, I was just at EclipseCon Europe, and I mentioned that I was from Rochester, Minnesota. Well, a lot of people, they think of Rochester, and they're thinking United States, and the only town that, or city that they come up with is Rochester, New York. Well, that's not exactly where I'm from. Minnesota, Rochester, Minnesota is in central United States, up near Canada. We've got quite a drive to get up there, but that's where Rochester is. So then people say, okay, well, what, besides IBM, what else is in Rochester? And so maybe you've heard of the Mayo Clinic. So that's the home of the Mayo Clinic. Wanted to give you a little bit of context as to where I'm from and what, you know, my, my background is. So, Ivar? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ivar Grimstad. Uh, I'm, I'm from uh, Norway, uh, but I'm based in Sweden. I don't put it on a mapper. I guess you know where Sweden is. <laughs> so, uh, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Java community process. I'm in the executive committee, and I'm actually up for election now. So if you're an associate member, please vote for me. Uh, I'm, um, I'm also involved in the uh, Jakarta E uh, at Eclipse Foundation, where I'm with Kevin in the e for j PMC. Uh, I'm also in the Jakarta working groups working there. Uh, I also put up Apache there because I'm an Apache NetBeans committer and I run a, a local Java user group in Malmo in Sweden. Uh, for all of this, I've, I've also been awarded to be a Java champion. I'm also an Oracle Groundbreaker ambassador. Uh, and these are my Twitter and uh, that's where you contact me. So thank hey. you. And I will leave the word to Kevin and okay. give you an introduction here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take you back in time a little bit. Um, I don't know how many of you went to Java 1 back in 2015. Ian Robinson and I did a presentation, and at that time we're wondering, okay, what is the future of Java EE? Is it an elephant or is it still relevant? And the idea is, you know, we, we didn't know what was happening with Java EE. It had really come to kind of a standstill, and we didn't know what the future was going to be with Java EE going forward. So um, we, we brought this up, we talked through it in a presentation, and then we got together early in 2016. So the, I think it was like the following February, we were at um, DevOps UK, 
And there were a few of us together, and we started talking about what's the future of Java EE and the microservices environment. We knew we wanted to do something. Java EE wasn't moving in that direction, but we needed to do something. So we came up with this idea for microprofile. We actually came up with, you know, the, if you're familiar with Java EE, we have the full platform, then we have a web profile, and we came up with microprofile. Well, one thing people are thinking, well, microprofile is smaller than web profile, but that's not the idea of it. Micro stood for microservices. So this is the microservices profile that we came up with. We knew that there were certain characteristics of this group. We, you know, we didn't know exactly how we were going to form it yet, but we knew that we wanted it more community driven. Java EE in the past has really been driven by Oracle. And yes, we did have community participation. I mean, I, IBM participated, Red Hat participated, Tommy Tribe participated. We had a lot of different groups and individuals participating in Java EE, but it still was really owned and driven by Oracle. And we wanted to be more community driven. We knew we wanted lighter weight, more iterative processing for microprofile. Any of you that are familiar with Java EE, you knew that it took several years to get a new platform out for Java EE. We knew that was not going to be sufficient for microprofile. We knew that we had to do things quicker. We, the whole microservices process, the event, was happening so fast in the industry that we knew that we had to be able to react quicker to the requirements that were coming in. So that was another one of our goals. The other thing that we wanted to do, we knew that we wanted to continue to define specifications or requirements, however we want to describe that. We need the APIs and we need TCKs, the test suites, in order to verify an implementation. The one thing that we wanted to get away from, though, was, let's see, oh, maybe that. Oh, OK, that's not going to work. So reference implementations. We don't want a single reference implementation. We didn't want to have, like, just Glassfish. We wanted the ability to define multiple compatible implementations. Now, the compatible implementations is actually a term that we coined with Jakarta EE, but the same thing is applying to microprofile. So the idea is that each specification that we come out with, you know, I'll just use config as an example, <clears throat> we might use Open Liberty to support config 1.1 as an example. And that's how we demonstrate compatibility with config 1.1 is using Open Liberty. Well, let's say then when we do config 1.2, maybe there's another lead that kind of picks that up. That's another difference is that we want to be able to have you know, a very fluid process and maybe the person that led 1.1 becomes busy with other activities. So another p person picks up 1.2 and at that time, maybe they're more familiar with Wildfly. So they use Wildfly to prove the implementation of config 1.2. So that's the idea to move away from reference implementations. So by Java 1, 2016, so if you remember I said, DevOps UK early in 2016, we came up with this idea. And by the time of September of 2016, we came up with this announcement for MicroProfile 1.0. Now at that time, all that we decided is we had three technologies from Java EE that provided the base for every microservice. We said this is the minimum. So we picked CDI, JSON-P, and JAX-RS. We said, OK, those three technologies from Java EE, that provides the base for every or for most microservices. Okay, So that's what we defined. One thing, it made it very easy for all of the people that were involved with MicroProfile, we could immediately implement this because we all supported Java EE, so it was very easy for us to do that. 
And at the same time, I mean, we had quite the discussion to define, okay, what is the minimum? And other people, other organizations, they were trying to put in other things, and it, it was quite the conversation until we figured out, okay, what is the minimum? That's what we were focusing on. Since that time, okay, so only about two years later, we're, you know, 2018 now, Java 1 just got done, or now it's called Oracle Code 1. But look at how far we have come. We've had seven platform releases. So that means MicroProfile, 101112. We got that up to 1.4. We also have a two-point stream going because the two-point X stream is based off of Java EE8. So we've got multiple platform releases, 17 component releases. So the components, I mean like the ones listed here, uh, open API, metrics, health check, those are the components. So as each of those have incremented, we've had each of uh, those component releases. So you can see that we are moving much faster than Java EE, okay? Two years time, seven platform releases, 17 component releases. Oh, I should back up here just, just to explain one thing. I'm not going to go into um, all the detail of the individual components. That's going to be more of uh, Ivar's part when he starts going into the coding aspect. But uh, when you get the charts, I think I'll be posting them sometime this week. Uh, when I post the charts, I do have background on every one of these blocks. So if you're interested in what open API is or what open tracing is, I've got a separate chart for each of those, and it takes you to the specification and to the GitHub repository and a short description of each one. So that'll give you some background, but I'm not going to go into all of that detail on, um, during this part of the presentation. So some of the things that we're working on down the road. So we just released MicroProfile 2.1. So what are some things that we're looking at for MicroProfile 2.1? 2.2, 2.3, uh, coming down the road. First of all, over on your right-hand side, we're looking at several component updates. So the ones in blue, those will continue to be updated as we move forward. Now, even um, we have metrics 2.0, that's introducing some changes to APIs. So they're bumping the major version. Um, I think we have just decided that fault tolerance will be doing the same thing, so I think that one's being bumped up to a 2.0 level as well. Those along the top, these are some of the ideas that we're looking at. The reactive streams operators, that's one of the items that we're very actively, we're, we're very close to a 1.0 release. Um, we're, we're still working through some issues with that, you know, going through the discussions, but that one's coming along very nicely. Reactive messaging, that's maybe a little bit further out. Service mesh, the Istio integration, that you know, may be a little bit further out. Other ones that we're looking at, um, we've got concurrency, so microprofile concurrency, and what we're looking at doing there is enhancing the concurrency utilities that are defined for Java EE. So here's an example of how we're doing the innovative aspect of microprofile. The Jakarta EE environment isn't quite ready for us to do the extra work on the Java EE specs yet. Okay, so we're still working through some of those issues. So in the meantime, concurrency, some items that we need to get into concurrency utilities, we're going to be prototyping, innovating, releasing as part of microprofile. So we're looking at doing microprofile concurrency and eventually, then that would merge into Jakarta EE. And I've, I've got some charts on how we're looking at doing that a little bit later. But just to give you an idea, we've got several things on our backlog um, related to future versions of MicroProfile. I mentioned compatible implementations earlier. This chart here shows the breadth of uh, compatible implementations that we have available for MicroProfile. We have all of these groups. We have everybody involved to some extent with MicroProfile. 
Not everybody is on the latest microprofile specification implementation. Several of them are. Several of them I know are working on microprofile 2.1. I think almost everybody is up to 1.4, 1.3, 1 1.4 uh, from a microprofile perspective. Whether or not they support Java EE8 is a little you know, stepping block for them in order to move forward uh, to support the microprofile 2.x branch. But we feel very honored and blessed to have this many implementations of microprofile available. The URL that's at the bottom here, that gives you all of the implementations and what levels of microprofile are supported, as well as the individual components that are supported. So for example, maybe you're only interested in uh, open tracing. You can go right to that area and find out, okay, what implementations are available for open tracing 1.1 or 1.2? Okay, if you want to move up to a microprofile platform level, then you can look at that as well. We've got all of the um, components and platform releases identified on that page with all of the supporting implementations. Okay, so that kind of gave a background of microprofile. So now, I want to talk a little bit about Java EE and Jakarta EE. We still were not really sure what was happening with Java EE. So, not last year, or yes, last year, excuse me, two years ago, they came out with Java EE 8 at, at Java 1. And they had this roadmap of what they were going to do for Java EE 9 and etc. During the summer of 2017, Oracle contacted a few of the key individual or the key vendors that are participating in Java EE and said, oh, we need to talk to you about something. And we had no idea. So we get together with the lead people from Oracle and they say, we're thinking about moving Java EE to open source. I, we never in our wildest imagination thought that Oracle would be coming, offering that type of move. We were very happy. We were very, you know, we were elated that they were thinking about doing this. So they wanted to get something in place by Java 1 of 2017. They wanted to be able to announce this at Java 1. And so there are a lot of movement happening there. We knew that we uh, we're going to be moving it to an open source foundation. By the time of Java 1, we didn't know exactly which one yet. We were still having the discussions with all the different foundations, trying to figure out which one would be the best match. By Java 1, we didn't quite have that figured out, but it was shortly thereafter that we were able to announce that we were going to be moving it to Eclipse. So this year, 2018, this has really been a lot of activity and work of moving all of the Java EE activity from the, it, it was kind of open, it was in their GitHub repositories and stuff, but it needed to be contributed to the Eclipse Foundation. This chart I've been showing for the past year. Um, this here on the left-hand side continues to change. Every time I do this presentation, I mean, even if we're only a month away, I just did EclipseCon Europe, and this chart has changed since then. What we are doing is tracking every one of the major components of Java EE as it's moving to uh, Jakarta EE, and where are we at in the process. You'll notice that you know, it's not as simple. I, I know I've talked with various people and they say, what, what's so difficult? You've got the code in GitHub in one repository. Why can't you just move it over to another GitHub repository under Jakarta EE and you're done? Well, there's a lot more to that. If any of you have been involved in any of this aspect of moving code to an open source foundation, you have to prove and show that you have the rights to move this to an open source foundation. Um, so all of the code has to be reviewed. There's scans that have to be done. Make sure that the licensing is okay. 
Um, the certificate of origination, you know, do you have the okay to actually move it to an open source foundation? You have to go through all of that process. So there was a lot of work that Oracle had to do in their scanning of the code to figure out how are we going to be able to move it over to Jakarta. Once we moved it, or move it over to Eclipse, once it has been decided that it's going over to Eclipse, then there's a little bit of a process to actually provision the project within Eclipse, taking it through the you know, provisioning of the uh, repositories and the different infrastructure within Eclipse. And then once the code is over there, then we have to make sure that everything's buildable, testable, you know, we, we can actually do something with it. Now, the final, you'll see that almost everybody is at 80%. So that, that means everything's over there. All the code is over there. We have done all, you know, you can build it, you can test with it. But the 100% mark, that's the one for doing an Eclipse release. So this is where we have to take the code through the final little process of Eclipse to actually do a release and get that out, you know, officially out the door. We are pushing very hard to have all those releases done by the end of November. We don't know if we're going to be able to make that just because of some of the processes with Eclipse, but that's our goal, and we're, we're moving quite a bit. If any of you are following our activity on the mailing list, you'll see that there's a lot of releases that are being proposed and going through the process. So hopefully, we're going to make it by the end of November. So what is so important about this? Well, one of the things that we are trying to do, we want to produce an Eclipse Glassfish. So, Glassfish reference implementation. We want to be able to build that out of the material that's in Eclipse. We're calling it release 5.1, and we want that to be Java EE8 compliant. We did come out with an RC1, release candidate one, right before EclipseCon and Oracle Code 1. And that was a major accomplishment uh, in order to actually produce everything. So all the code was over there. We were able to build it, put it together, and actually have an executable um, glass fish. Now, I'm sure we're going to have multiple release candidates before this is done. But this was, this was a huge relief for the development team to be able to produce this. I'll show you a little bit on the schedule that we have in place here. So the ones that are checked, those are the ones that we are passed. We, we're, we're done with those. Those look good. You'll notice November 12th, okay? I think that's today, right? Um, we don't quite have all these dependencies all updated. They're pretty darn close, um, but, you know, we'll make it sometime this week, I think. The release reviews I mentioned, we're trying to get that done by the end of the month. And then the big goal, number one goal that we are trying to do is to have... Glassfish 5.1, available by the end of the year. We picked the middle of December because we figured I have a little bit of wiggle room there, but we want it to be Java EE8 compliant. We want to be able to put Eclipse Glassfish on the Java EE8 compatible website that Oracle owns. That's our goal by the end of the year. So I want to give you a little bit of background on some of the work that we've been going through. And um, uh, what, one of the items is the CI CD process. So we have to get this all automated for every one of the projects. And I should point out, each of those projects that I had up there that were 39, 40 different projects, every one of those projects have probably three or four GitHub repositories. And every one of those have to be released. So you'll notice here the CI/CD process. This is one chart that has really been changing. I, I said that you know over the course of the summer and the fall with the different conferences I've been at. This is just in fantastic shape now. Um, when I first did this one back in June at EclipseCon France, we had maybe five done. Um, as far as the different uh, GitHub repositories. And you can see now that we have all of the CI CD processing done for all of the projects and all of the repositories within Jakarta EE. We're trying to stage all of the APIs. 
within, um, within GitHub, within Maven, and trying to get the things available. We've got, you know, you can see we've got different ones. Um, almost all of them are at least assigned. We've got 10 in progress, 19 of them are done. Now, this is as of last week. This may have been a little bit, you know, better now. I, I don't know. I didn't check this morning. But what this is doing is all of the APIs that were under the Java EE, Group ID and Artifact ID for Maven, we are now trying to get them out using the Jakarta EE, Group ID and Artifact ID. So that whole process of being able to release them to Maven, that's what we are trying to do with this, and this is how we are tracking it. We also have the different implementations of the old Java EE implementations and moving them forward to Jakarta EE. You can see this one, we've got a little bit more to do. We only have like four items done. We still need help. I, I should put that out. If anybody is interested, this is an open source project now. So it's not just Oracle run. If any of you have an interest in participating in this, we would welcome the assistance. So if any of you have an interest in trying to help out with Jakarta EE, we do have, we've got work queued up um, that we could use some help with. So what we're doing here is that each of the implementations that we have for Glassfish, each of those need to be built, tested, and released into, you know, both as part of Eclipse as well as getting into Maven. And you can see here, this was just another um, project uh, release dashboard that we were tracking is making sure that everything is moving to the Jakarta Maven coordinates. So we're trying to make a clean break at this time so that when we come out and say that we have Glassfish 5.1, then all of the Java EE content from Java EE 8 will now be available in the Jakarta namespace for in Maven. Just to clarify, that is not saying that the package names are changing. Right now, the package names are still all the same, Java dot, Java X dot. So you don't, don't have to change your code. But if you want to start using the things from Jakarta, you will have to modify your, your Maven coordinates to pull it from a different location. Okay, So that's, that's the thing that's changing, not the package names. Just want to clarify that. Every time this comes up in our mailing list, it, it does get kind of confusing because as soon as we say a, a Jakarta namespace, then people think, oh, crap, i got to change all my code. No, you don't have to change your code. All that is still the same Java X. This is just the access in Maven. Okay, so the other thing that we're doing besides the code. Within Jakarta, we need to define a specification process. Now, probably ask, well, why do you have to define a whole new process? Well, the old things with Java EE, that was governed by the JCP. The JCP was a standards organization. We need something similar within Eclipse in order to provide that rigor, that, um, that uh, capability to define specifications so that you know, people know what they're getting. So if they're getting access to Jakarta EE9, for example, or JAXRS 2.2, for example, they know that, okay, this is the defined specification. This is the one that is blessed by Eclipse. So we had to define a new specification process. These dates, you know, they, they're a little out of date. The URL is still active. So you can look at the current version of the spec document. We did not get a whole lot of changes requested to the specification process. We got a lot of comments that just said, yep, it looks good. Yep, ship it. You know, So people did take a look at it but very few comments to change it, which actually you know, made us feel good that, okay, maybe we did do an okay job with this. Um, then again, maybe people didn't read it very closely. So we don't know, but you know, we feel that we can modify it. So even though we're trying to complete this, we should be seeing it relatively soon where it's saying, okay, here's our blessed specification process for Eclipse. 
then we can eventually... Um, so I, I should back up just a little bit. So one thing that this is doing is defining a specification process for all of Eclipse because there's other working groups, not just Jakarta, that want to use a specification process. So we're going to have a defined Eclipse specification process, and then there will be a version that's for Jakarta EE. I know that IoT is interested, so then there will be an IoT, IoT specification process. So there will be derivatives of the base specification process. Okay? Now, this here, we're trying to complete. We're having review meetings right now. Hopefully, it's happening you know, within the next month or so to put our final blessing on it and get it available. The other thing to point out, we have a guinea pig project. There's an Eclipse project right now called Eclipse J No SQL. They have volunteered to be the first Jakarta EE specification process or project. It's going to be Jakarta EE J No SQL. So they're going to try to work through our process, you know, and we're going to be working with them. So the group seems very willing to roll with the punches, and same with us for the specification process. So if we find something that isn't quite right, you know, and things have to change a little bit, we'll go back and modify it. Maybe we'll have a 1.1 version of the spec process or 1.2. That's okay. That's why we're trying to be more iterative. But uh, having a, a guinea pig project, I think, will be very helpful to test us before we start releasing it to everybody. So besides that, there's other things that we're working on for Jakarta EE. We have the TCK compliance process. We got to figure out, okay, how are we going to be able to test out these different implementations so that these implementations can say, you know, have the stamp and say, I am Jakarta EE compliant. Or maybe it's Jakarta EE web profile compliant, wh whatever the, the capability is. We have to um, nail down that process. The TCK license, being able to get access to the TCK. Now, I want to clarify that a little bit. The TCKs themselves now will be totally, I mean, they are right now, they're out in our GitHub repositories under the EPL license. Any of you can go out and take a look at them right now. You can't build them yet. That's in our readme. We're still working through some of that process. But all of the code is there. Now, why we need to define a TCK license besides that, that's part of our compatibility, our certification testing. Because we need to have a defined set of tests that customers or implementers could go to and say, okay, I want to be Jakarta EE9 compliant. Boom, here's your test bucket, and these are the ones that you need to run to verify that you're Jakarta EE9 compliant. In order to get access to that set of binaries, we're going to have a TCK license. So that's why we need a separate license. But if you just want access to the TCK source code and eventually start building them and running with them and testing them, have at it. They're out in Eclipse, and you can uh, start using it. And then the specification license. We still need something like this in order to help with the IP flow. The Java EE model from Oracle was more, if you're familiar with it, a, a hub and scope type, um, <clears throat> excuse me, hub and spoke type model where all of the IP fled into Oracle, and then Oracle would distribute it based on licensing for the different vendors and implementers. Because of Eclipse, we're not having a defined specification lead. It's just a specification project, and that lead can change. So because of that, we have to adjust the IP flow a little bit, and we're trying to make it much easier that's one of the reasons, though, why we need a specification license so that people are aware of how the IP flows in that process. Okay, so that was the end of Jakarta EE. So now, where are we at? We've got MicroProfile and we have Jakarta EE. You'll notice, I mean, through the presentation and the things that I've been, work, um, been discussing so far, we are both focused on 
uh, microservice development, and cloud-native development. We want processes that are more agile, more nimble, more, um, more iterative, so that we're not waiting for the big bang releases every three to four years. We want things to be happening quicker. And we have the code first mentality. We want to be able to prove that these different ideas that are coming through the specifications are actually doable and implementable and usable. I mean, one example that I use here all the time, the old EJBs. If any of you are familiar you know, with the EJB2 model for persistence, the BMP and CMP, okay, that was, I mean, you can blame IBM because of, uh, IBM really pushed a lot of this, but um, we, we had this spec that we just thought, you know, th this is the best thing since sliced bread, but we didn't have an implementation across multiple vendors. And so that whole idea, I say it failed. Okay, now just move forward a few years and look at EJB3 and JPA. Now that was based on some existing work that Hibernate has done really with, with JPA and the idea of dependency injection coming from Spring and those ideas came in and we were able to use that and then standardize it. Okay, that EJB model along with persistence, that's successful. So it was built off of existing code that was proven that it could work. That's what we want to do with Jakarta EE. I'm going to go back to this chart just to kind of show I use this for microprofile. We want to be able to use a lot of the same ideals that we've been using for microprofile and move that in to Jakarta EE. Community driven, absolutely. I mean, I've got some charts coming up here that show the wide community working on both microprofile and Jakarta EE. This is key to get input from so many different individuals and vendors. Lightweight iterative processing. Okay, now this one here, we aren't quite at the same level as what we have for microprofile. If you compare the spec process that was developed for, um, for Jakarta EE, but we kept that in mind. We're trying to figure out how can we have a smaller, more nimble process for specifications, but still allow us to, um, you know, to, to change down the road. And it's, it, it, it's been kind of tough. Um, our spec process, if you look at it, it looks a little bit heavier weight than microprofile, granted. But it's not as tough as what we had through the JCP. So we're kind of in the middle. Now, Maybe that'll still shift a little bit. What we'll have to find out as we start working projects through the different um, through through the different process. But the one key thing that we are keeping the same is no reference implementation. So yes, we do have Glassfish out there. We have to do that in order to prove that we are Java EE8 compliant. Okay, so that that's out there. But going forward. Let, let's say as an example, because JAXRS is one of the components that are moving forward uh, within the Jakarta EE umbrella. And they're looking at you know, JAXRS 2.2, 2.3. Maybe something that they're doing in one of those specifications, maybe for whatever reason, maybe the people aren't ready to step up to it in Jersey. And maybe Apache CXF says, well, hey, I can show that I'm compatible with that. So maybe they'll be the compatible implementation for a future version of JAXRS. I'm just throwing that out as an example. I don't want to put anyone on the edge. But that's just the idea of not having a single reference implementation. And we're pulling, we're pulling that idea from microprofile into Jakarta EE. Okay, I've already mentioned this a couple of times. Microprofile is moving very fast. We have more things in our backlog. We've got our bucket pretty full with things that are coming in Microprofile 2.2, 2.3. Oh, maybe I should mention this too. For those of you that are working with Microprofile, we were driving for a quarter, quarterly release. We were trying to do four releases per year. We didn't quite get to that, so at the end or in the middle of this year, we reevaluated that and we said, okay, how often can we really do a release? 
we came up with doing three releases per year, and we're kind of targeting the conference sessions. So we're doing a spring one in the February time frame. We're going to do one in June for the summer conferences and one in October for the fall conferences. So next year, we're driving for three microprofile releases. We're not going to see Jakarta EE. Even after we figure out Jakarta EE 8 and we're moving to Jakarta EE 9, we're not going to have three releases of Jakarta EE 9 in a year. There is no way we could handle that. But can we do one or maybe two releases per year? Yes, that, that's our goal. We want things to be moving quicker with Jakarta EE. I mentioned how Jakarta EE needs to replace the JCP. That is a much bigger piece of work than what we had with MicroProfile. MicroProfile never meant to be a standards body. I will be talking about this in just a little bit, but the MicroProfile specifications, they were never meant to be a standard. They were meant to be an innovative aspect of microservices development. And eventually, that capability could be moved into a standard. But we were never meant to be a standard. So there's a difference there between MicroProfile and Jakarta EE. Part of it is because the Jakarta EE brand is much more valuable than MicroProfile. So we need something in place in order for vendors to claim Jakarta EE compliance. MicroProfile, on the other hand, we are kind of on the honor system. If an implementation comes along and says, yep, I implemented MicroProfile 1.4 and I tested it, it's like, great, thank you very much, put your name on our page, we're done. We don't ask them to publish the results or anything. It's all on the honor system. I don't expect that same thing to be coming through on Jakarta EE. I would guess with Jakarta EE, we're already working through that process, and somehow the vendors are going to have to post the results just to prove that, yes, I ran with this bucket, I got these results, and we're going to be um, Jakarta EE compliant. So a little difference there. But... How do these two groups, how do these two processes, how will they eventually merge together? So the one of them that I use an example is the REST client for MicroProfile. Now, this one is um, something that was actually kind of along the lines of concurrency uh, that I was talking about earlier. The JAXRS team, or some members of JAXRS team, they knew that they wanted to do something for a type-safe REST client, but JAXRS was too far along with the Java EE8 deliverable that they weren't able to fit this in. So they kind of jumped over and looked at MicroProfile, and they said, hey, look, we can prototype it here. We can start working through this. I think we're up to, I think REST client 1.2 is the next one coming out. This is proven to be a very popular component of MicroProfile. Now, eventually, could that move into Jakarta? Absolutely. I know that the JAXRS team is already considering at least some aspects, if not the whole thing, of REST client. So there's an example where we're able to innovate, prove it in MicroProfile, and eventually it should move over to the standard for JAXRS. Another example is the config JSR. So config is a component of MicroProfile. Another very popular component. The, um, we were looking to standardize config. At the time, Java EE was still real. The JCP was still in place to support Java EE. So we went forward and proposed a config JSR. That's in process right now. We have spec leads in place. We have a whole expert group. We've got a large group of people working towards a config JSR. Well, now, does that still make sense? This is something that we're considering. If we have a new spec process within Jakarta EE, and config will eventually become part of Jakarta EE, well, then should we be using the new spec process instead of the JSR? If we stay with the JSR, then we have to make sure that all that licensing and stuff from the JCP will flow over to Eclipse and Jakarta EE properly. So that, that's a little bit of a headache. Um, 
so why don't we just skip that and just say, hey, eventually you're going to get in Jakarta EE, so why don't we just use a new spec process? So we're working with this team. It's up to their, you know, it's up to that team. We can't force it. Oracle's not going to force it. Um, the JCP is not going to um, force it. But this is something that the expert group is going to have to evaluate and figure out which way do they want to go. The reactive platform. I mentioned a couple of the specifications that we're working on for reactive operators and reactive messaging. This is a fantastic blog if, if, um, and the URL, if you, you know, eventually it will be in the um, charts that I post. The team from Lightbend posted this blog. They said, how did we end up in microprofile? And they did a fantastic job of going through their thought process. What did they do to, you know, they knew they wanted to try to standardize something. They had a lot of work in their Lightbend reactive environment, but they needed to make it grow a little bit. And they wanted to get it better known and get it more standardized. So should they move to Java EE? Well, probably not. Should they move to Jakarta EE? Well, yeah, eventually they would like to do that, but Jakarta EE wasn't ready yet. So microprofile, yep, we were there with open arms, and we said, come on in. So they talked about how they were starting with microprofile, but maybe eventually they would move over to Jakarta EE. No timeline in place here, but this is what they wrote about, that this is what they eventually want to do. This really isn't like a direct move to Jakarta EE, but this is some other stuff that we're looking at. So microprofile has fault tolerance, and there's what, five? Five different things that we support for fault tolerance uh, programming model. I talked earlier about integration with a service me mesh, or Istio. So there, you're not modifying your code, but you can get many of the fault tolerance capabilities just by using that service mesh. Now, the only one that I can't provide is fallback processing because it's not going to be able to in or, um, insert additional code for a fallback, you know, a fallback routine. So it can't do that aspect, but everything else, it can do that just by configuration of the runtime. So do we, you know, is this something that we need to be aware of? Um, config is another area that maybe it works differently within an Istio or service mesh environment. This is a separate working group within MicroProfile, and we're trying to figure out what is the right path. Now, here's an example. People have asked, well, how come you don't just move all of MicroProfile under Jakarta EE? Well, part of the reason is maybe it doesn't all fit under Jakarta EE. Maybe some of it is just like an integration with other runtimes. So this is why I want to bring this up so that you can see that we're looking at trying to uh, bring the MicroProfile capabilities more, if you want to call it more mainstream, or working with other environments. So maybe it's not Jakarta EE, but maybe it's, maybe it's in the Istio environment. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about the different communities and show how we are trying, and we're, we're actually all working together. This is a set of the different vendors and implementers within the Jakarta EE community. You'll see several of the key people, you know, of course, IBM, Red Hat, Oracle are all up there. You'll notice some new people up there, Microsoft, uh, Pivotal, people that never participated in Java EE in the past, and they're interested in knowing what are we doing with Jakarta EE. They want to participate. Now, some of these other players, maybe they aren't directly involved in our specifications yet, but they want to know how can they participate. One of them in particular that I can use as an example, we have a Java batch, okay? That's within Java EE. We are in the process of moving that over to Eclipse. IBM, we own the Java batch right now within Java EE, and we're looking to move it over to Eclipse Jakarta EE. Part of that, well, not part of that reason, but I mean, as part of that move, 
Pivotal has expressed an interest in participating in that group in Jakarta EE. So there's a big plus of having um, you know, a more open community. So now here's the microprofile community. Um, you'll notice a lot of the same vendors between the two. Still quite a few, quite a variety of vendors and implementers here. So here are the two communities and now this next graphic really shows how the, the overlap between these two, two communities. You can see the major players that are participating in both. So if you hear people saying that it's um, microprofile versus Jakarta EE, there, there's no way. I mean, look at all the people that are participating in both. They want both of them to succeed. So eventually, we will have more of an integration between these two environments. I would not hesitate at all if you are interested in microprofile to get started with that. Many of those aspects will eventually merge into Jakarta EE. But right now, Jakarta EE just isn't ready to accept all of them. But we are in that process of working through it. OK, so that is about the first hour of, I guess, 50 minutes, 55 minutes of the presentation. Um, I'll open it up for questions. And then we're going to take a break. And then when we come back, then Ivar is going to be going through the coding exercise. So before we start, before we make a break, are there any questions? I know it's hard for me to see up there, but um, if you can stand up, I'll try and entertain any questions related to microprofile or Jakarta EE. Come on. No questions? There's t-shirts for a question. Okay, um, what should we do? Should we say 15, 15 minutes? Okay, about um, 25 to 11, we'll start again with uh, actual coding demonstrations and more in-depth uh, look at uh, microprofile and Jakarta EE. Okay, welcome to this second half of this uh, deep dive in Jakari and Microprofile. Uh, remember to vote for our session, or, and uh, if you like Kevin's presentation before I start, then give it a five now, and then uh, I don't have that much pressure on me. Uh, we still have t-shirts, so uh, questions are awarded. We have stickers as well, so, so uh, you can choose between a sticker or a t-shirt or both. Just um, hammer away with questions. Uh, what, I, what I will do is to uh, go through, I, I'm actually going to be a repetition of some of the stuff that Kevin said, but I'll uh, do it with code samples as well. Uh, I did run out of battery on my laptop while preparing here, so some of the code will actually be real live coding and never tested before. But um, since this is a cool and easy technology, this is going to work just fine. So uh, I'll give some background, uh, some repetition about what Kevin said, and uh, go through microprofile, uh, what's happened between the specifications, and uh, uh, go into uh, details about the latest versions and show demos using, using different uh, vendors' uh, implementations. So uh, Kevin touched into why microprofile. We all know what happened with Java E8 and, what, and why uh, microprofile got started. And there is a need for cloud-native Java EE, and there is an interest uh, for it. Uh, just look at the, the slides with all the, the vendors involved in, in, uh, and interested in Jakarta EE. Uh, so Eclipse Microprofile, uh, the place to get started with that, if you want to check it out, is microprofile.io. It's easy to remember. Uh, just go in there and click around. Uh, you can see the code, the, the uh, specifications, the samples, all the projects. Uh, you can get it involved by just joining the email list uh, and just start discussing. And it's a very open community, so everybody is welcome. If you more, want more details on how to, to actually become a contributor uh, to Microprofile, uh, then uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, there is a web page uh, or project page for uh, Microprofile there as well. 
So uh, Kevin touched a little bit into the, the profiles and, and uh, I'll also just uh, repeat a little bit about that. So uh, we've had since Java 6 the full profile and the web profile. And the, and the first step to creating a micro profile was just to pick a subset of that. And that was just because everybody had it, it was easy to just pick out a little piece of the web profile and get started with it. And, and the piece that they uh, chose to use was JAXRA, CDI, and JSONP, because that's basically what you need uh, to create a, ba a simple microservice. If you want to go a little bit more, uh, uh, more advanced stuff, uh, the web profile provides your support for web sockets, bean validations, EJBs, etc., and persistence, and also some, some things for creating UIs, which isn't that useful for creating microservices, uh, but for, for regular web applications, that's uh, where you go. And uh, if you want to go more enterprise-y things uh, with Batch and JMS and, and uh, that kind of things, it's uh, the full profile. Another thing that has been uh, an issue with Java EE uh, uh, previously has been the, the way of packaging the application. And it's not the packaging of the Java EE applications in itself, but it's the way that we are uh, handling it. And, and it's, it's been typically to have some kind of data center somewhere in the basement that some people are handling your your big precious application server, and we as developers, we create our super thin wars, uh, nice uh, applications, and just throw them to these guys in the basement, and they deploy it into the application server, and they run there, and since they're uh, expensive to set up, and expensive hardware and everything, uh, these services often end up running in the same container or the uh, uh, same application server. And sooner or later, you will get into problems with some service uh, consuming too much memory or something that will affect the other services, and you will get into problems. So the cloud changes everything of this, but the packaging mechanism of, of, of Java EE is, is still uh, useful there. And, and Java EE has always been the thin war approach. That means you have a provider dependency and your application is just your code. It's, it's, you're talking kilobytes rather than megabytes. And the reason for that is, uh, while we, uh, we, since we are a Java-based system, we rely on some kind of hardware or virtualization stuff, some operating system and the JVM. And on top of that, uh, we run our applications. And in the Java EE case, uh, we run the Java EE container or application server, and we just have our thin war uh, that we drop into the, the container. And, and with the introduction of microservices, and, uh, and uh, maybe Spring Boot in particular, we got the uh, concepts of Uber jars, or fat jars. And if you compare that to the thin war approach of application servers, uh, we still have the hardware operating system and JVM, as we also have in the Java ecosystem, and then we have the application that contains everything. And it's kind of a self-contained unit. You can just run it uh, typing java-jar uh, on your command or, or uh, your system that is running your applications. And this has uh, become very popular. And uh, we didn't have this kind of thing in, in the Java EE world. We, yeah, you could, could do it, but uh, still, it, it hasn't been standard. Uh, another interesting approach is the hollow jar. And, and the hollow jar is similar to the the uh, Uber jar, uh, only that you uh, package your application server stuff that your application rely on, the services, in a jar, and you keep your war as a thin war. So it's kind of in between the Uber jar and the uh, thin war of Java EE. And this is interesting uh, when you start talking about containers. If you put them uh, beside each other, uh, the, the Uber jar approach uh, just need some kind of JVM to run. For the, the, uh, the hollow jar in the middle, uh, I'll call it microprofile container here, it could be a Java EE container as well, but that's kind of the Duke's jar in, in between there. So you can have a prepackaged pre container with the layer of the parts of the application server that your server relies on, and then your application is actually a thin war. So it will be similar to the Java EE container, but here you have the entire Java EE container uh, in, in the, the uh, stack and your application on top of it. 
And, and when you put Docker uh, into this equation, the, the, uh, the image is the same, and, and uh, Docker uh, will typically run on, on some kind of uh, operating system and use parts of the operating system that your application needs. And uh, the, the other stuff are just layers in your container. And from the outside, it doesn't matter. Like if you run Kubernetes or, or Docker containers in some kind of environment, from the outside, it's just Docker run. And, and, uh, but from the inside, when you, when you build these images, and so the, the build time and the deploy time, if you can rely on layers that are already cached there, uh, the, the uh, cycle will be faster if you have a thinner layer that you do the change. So if you do a bug fix in your application, rather than redeploying the entire Uber jar layer, you just uh, uh, replace the, the thin war of the microprofile application or Java E application. So, microprofile them. So this is a little bit of repetition from, from the last section. So Microprofile 1.0 uh, came in, in September 2016, just before Java 1 that year, and it had uh, the three specific specifications, CDI, JSONP, and JAXRS. And uh, about would be nine months later, uh, we got an addition to Microprofile, and here is where it diverged a little bit from the Java E, because here we add a specification that is not part of, of Java E, and that was the config. And config later become a JSR, as Kevin explained, that will uh, potentially have, uh, make it through to uh, Jakarta E. And later that year, uh, we got more stuff. And this is where the, it actually started getting interested. The other thing was kind of things to play around with and make simple stuff. But here you get some microservices support that support the common uh, patterns uh, uh, implement for uh, microservices, such as the health check API, such as me uh, application metrics. You got some fault tolerance and also uh, the security I expect with uh, JSON web tokens. And uh, in, in the Microsoft 103, you also added uh, support for, for tracing, distributed tracing across the services. Uh, you got some documentation support for, with the Open API specification and a types of uh, REST client, which is also useful for creating microservices. And here you can see the, the releases are coming pretty rapidly because we, we uh, just a couple of months later we got Microprofile one of four, which was uh, an update release to the previous one. So it didn't add any new specification; it just updated the previous ones. And at the same time as Microprofile 1 and 4 came out, Microprofile 2.0 came out. And this one was also exactly the same as 1 and 4, only the, the specification at the end, uh, the, the blue boxes is the CDI, JSONP, and JAXRS. These are now Java E8 versions. So now we took the step from Java E7 to Java E8. And also the JSONB specification, which was a part of Java E8, uh, came along as well. And since then, uh, we also have a, a mic, uh, Microprofile 2 to 1, which recently came out, uh, which updated the open tracing specification. But uh, uh, a, a specification without implementations isn't that interesting. And uh, what's cool about Microprofile is that we have a lot of implementations. We have the the uh, usual players that you would uh, see here with uh, IBM or Red Hat and Oracle, uh, Poyara, etc. And you also have the, 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 uh, the uh, implementation that you maybe not hear about that much, such as uh, Fujitsu with their launcher and, and Hammock, which is an open source uh, initiative. So I'll this was just a repetition of what Kevin said. I'll, I'll dive into the code and sh uh, show some of these specifications. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll use this chart as, as a help as we go along. So uh, all of them are using J CDI, JSONP, and JAXRS. So my uh, application will be a super simple, uh, just saying hello, but using these aspects. And uh, 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 in Java E8, we also got JSON B as the kind of the, the base layer. Uh, I, I won't directly demo that, but uh, it is there underneath. 
And uh, the open version specification uh, supports distributed transactions. And that's kind of a hard to demo here uh, on stage, so I'll skip that as a demo. Uh, but what I will demo is the others. And I'll start with the open API. So. There we go. So uh, here I have a super simple uh, application. And, and uh, the uh, only thing this one does is it, it has a lot of code in it because it, it does uh, support a lot of deployments to different uh, environments and also to build it out to uh, a lot of different uh, application servers and cloud environments. Uh, but the main part of the code is this. And the thing we're focusing on when we're talking about the documentation part is that this one has, it's a JAXRS application, it has an endpoint called hello. And it has one method at get. So, so this is everything that this application does. It just responds to a uh, get. So what I want to do now is actually to just run this one. Uh, I'll just build it. I think I have a general target. So just build it as a jar. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which applications I used to build. Yeah, it looks like it's Liberty I used to build this one. So, so this one runs on web, uh, Open Liberty, uh, and, and uh, it just has a, a simple endpoint. And uh, I won't execute the endpoint, actually. What, what I will do is to go into the uh, any AD open API. And what you'll see here is that I, I haven't done anything to, to create this, but this is what I get for free by just having MicroProfile as uh, a dependency in my, uh, my uh, POM file. So then it generates the open API documentation for me. And, and this is what Swagger is, is based on. And, and IBM has actually been so cool that they have added a UI for us as well. So I can just go in here and, and actually go and see, here's my endpoint, and I can try it out and, and uh, execute my, my get method. And you can see it says, uh, Duke says hello. So, so uh, by just running it in a microprofile container, this is what I get. I haven't done anything, no code, n not a single line of code other than my actual logic, which is at get and at path. That's pretty cool. So forget about adding Swagger yourself and everything. It's just, it's just there. So the next one I'm, I'm going to show is the TypeSafe REST client. And you've actually seen it in action here, if you were paying attention. But uh, what I'm, I'm doing here in my, my, my application is that I'm injecting a at REST client. And this is a annotation coming from the, uh, the MicroProfile REST client project. So, so uh, and, and then I can call this uh, REST client, and it has a method called days to my birthday. And uh, let's go into and, and have a look at this one. And as you see, this is just an interface, birthday service, and it has an annotation called at register REST client. So, so, so uh, the only thing I do is, uh, is I create an interface and I use standard JAXRS annotations on the interface, and I just annotate it with register REST client, and the microprofile REST client component just takes care of it and generates a proxy to do that service call. Now, how do I configure this service? Yeah, well, I'm using microprofile config to configure it so I can point it to the endpoint I want to be using. And I'll go through the config later, but uh, to be short, I'm, I'm just putting it here in a configuration file where I say that this birthday service has a REST URL and, and it points to, to a service that I'm having running in a cloud environment somewhere else. And, and in the code, uh, I'm, I'm just calling this my birthday, and I think Duke was born around uh, July uh, 19. 95 sometimes. So when I do this call, uh, what you'll see, let me see, you can go to the browser. 
Here we go. If we go to localhost 9080, and just type hello. It will say, uh, Dick says hello, it's 247 days to my birthday. And if we calculate this, it's about that time to July next year. So, so, so uh, here we can see how easy it is to, to make a type safe call to another REST client. You don't have to use this JAX REST client builder and, and configuring what, uh, what uh, at path and, and all these. It's a nice fluent API, but, but it is kind of a little bit easier to just create an interface and say, this is the service I'm calling, and then have the, have the client generate it for me. So this is also, you just get it for free. I haven't done any coding yet. I'm just defining the interface. So let's move on to config. You've seen a small example here that the other specifications can use MicroProfile config to configure themselves, like the REST client did here. Uh, so, uh, but I can also use it for application configuration. And I'm injecting a config property here called message. And I'm giving it a default value uh, uh, that, that I'm calling hello. And, and so, so in this case, I, if I don't give this this uh, property message, set it somewhere in my system, it will get the default value hello. And that's what's happening here, uh, that you see my, my Duke says hello. And, uh, but if I do want to uh, uh, configure it, uh, I can do that using the default config sources in MicroProfile. And by default, it will look first in a, uh, in, in a um, uh, configuration file that is in the meta folder called MicroProfile config. So here I can actually put in and just configure it to and say message is hi and, and rebuild it. But rebuilding your application, that's not what, uh, what you want to do. What you want to do is just to configure it without rebuilding your image. So you can override this configuration you put in this file uh, by setting a, uh, a system uh, property. So when I run the application, I can, I can type Java dash jar and minus D and set the, the, message, uh, the, the property. Or I can set it as an environment variable in my Docker container. So, so in this case, I'll, I'll just use the, the uh, system property. So if I stop this server and I configure it by saying message is high, and just restart my application. So it's starting up, and it's ready, and it should now say, uh, Duke says, hi. So, so you see, I can configure my, my service externally without rebuilding the application. Now that's convenient, for, or it's a necessity for Microsoft, because you don't want to build your application again. So health checks. That's also a, a aspect important for microservices. Uh, think about Kubernetes. You want to have some kind of, of uh, when you set up the, the services and want to give a message to Kubernetes when you want to send traffic to your microservice. Or you want to have other services call to see if your services are up and running. And how many of you saw the community keynote at Code One or have seen it live streaming? OK. Then I won't show that example, but there we use the health check service to, 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 uh, uh, to check for the, the, the stones on Thanos Duke. So uh, I recommend to, to look that up on YouTube. It's out there. Look at the community keynotes. It's pretty cool. We, we're using health check there live on stage to, to uh, help conquer Thanos Duke. I won't say more. So uh, health checks, yes. So I have my application running, and, and I haven't configured any health checks or en done anything at all. But what I get here is actually I have a health endpoint that I get for free. It's just slash health, and it says it's up. So, so I don't have to code any health endpoint or do anything to have a health check, uh, and, and the system will, will be up and running. Of course, I could implement an interface and do the actual check and check if some database connection or whatever I want to check before I say that my service is healthy and, and then uh, uh, give it an up or down 
there. So security. So uh, JSON Web Token propagation. Uh, uh, that means that you, you uh, rather than having every service log in to some kind of uh, uh, authorization service to check if, hey, is this uh, client allowed to do this call and check what roles are there, uh, you can use uh, JWT propagation just to, to uh, uh, send the JSON web tokens to your service and hook into the Java EE role uh, access control. And, and it works as a charm. And I'll show you how easy it is. But to do that, I just have to start my token issuer service. So let me just bear with me here while I start this one. Where do I have it? There we go. I do have it somewhere here. So I'm just starting this in the background, and then we'll look at the code. So in this case, I have a somewhere I do have, um, let me see here. I have the, the secure Duke application. And it is similar to the, the uh, uh, Cloudy Duke, uh, only I'm, I'm having another greeting here. So, so what I'm saying here is I, uh, I'm having a greeting where I said Duke says uh, something, which is the hello message, uh, to, and then something, which is the subject from the token. And that is kind of the, the person that is logged in. And then I, I, I see uh, with the roles, and I get the groups that this person has. Uh, and I see who, who has issued this token. And, and this token is a JSON web token that I'm injecting. And the JSON web token is something I get from the uh, JSON web token or the security specification from MicroProfile. So um, uh, what I'm doing here is just inject the token, and then I can use it. What's also uh, uh, cool here, or the actually useful part, is that I can use the Java E security annotation and say that, hey, these are the roles that are allowed to do this call. And, I, and for this particular service, I'm requiring the caller to be an admin. So if you're not an admin, you're not allowed to call this service. It could be any role uh, that you have defined in a system. But I don't have to define these roles anywhere else or map these users to, to roles in this application. The only thing I need to do here is to be able to verify the signature of the JSON web token. And that is kind of a key change uh, with the issuer. So, so that depends on how that is done. In this case, I'm just sharing the keys. So I have the same key as, as uh, the, 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 the issuer. Uh, but I, I don't need to configure my server or application anything other than this. So if, if I do start this one, I'll just stop the, the cloud Duke I have running here so we don't have port conflicts. So if I go in here, and just start this server. So this one also runs on, on uh, Open Liberty, uh, or actually on, on Liberty, I think. No, Open Liberty, yes. So I'll show some other implementations later. So it's up and running on port 6060. So if I go in here, Hello, host, 6060, and hello. And I go in there, and you see, I get a 401. And, and that is actually good, because I'm not an admin. I haven't logged in or anything. So I'm not allowed to, to, uh, to do anything here. So, so let's try to add a token. And, and if I, uh, if I, before I do that, I can look in the log, and you see down here, it says the microprofile jot fixture cannot perform authentication because a token cannot be found. So, so there is no token in a request. So let's add a token. And I know that I have a token here in my poster that I've used before. So let's add this token and see how that goes. So I'm running again, but I still get a 401. So what happened there? So 
Then you can see here that there is a token, I can find it, but it expired. So okay, so I, I need to get a new token. So let's do that. So I go into my other application, the one I started in the uh, in the uh, uh, background, which is a uh, token issuer application. It could be any issuer, just you have to agree on which one you're using. And let's log in with with uh, uh, a user called Alice here. So I'm logging in uh, with Alice, and you can see uh, uh, Alice is a user, and and uh, and I get a JSON Web Token. So let's go and get the token, and let's use this one in my uh, request rather than the the one I had here. Let's just disable this one, enable here. This is Alice. Let's. Paste it in, and then do the request here. So I'm doing there, and now I get a 403, right? So now I'm not authorized. And, and, it, and, and uh, the reason why I'm not authorized is that you saw that uh, Alice was a user, and I can actually go into to this site, jwt.io, uh, which is a uh, pretty cool site, where I can just put my token here, and you can see here, this is how the JSON Web Token looks like. So you can see here that Alice is, is a user. And, that, and, and as you remember, I had declare roles, admin is required to do this service call. So let's log in with an admin and, and see if we can get uh, that person in. So if we go here, just log out Alice, log in Bob. And you see, we get a, uh, another token, and, and Bob is an admin. So let's go here and take this token and replace Alice's token with Bob's token. There. And then go back to my application and refresh it. And now it says, hello to Bob with role admin and user. And if I look at this token in the JSON Web Token Explorer here, you can see Bob is an admin and user. So that is these groups here are custom claims that are mapped directly into the uh, Java uh, role-based access control. So I can use at declare roles to protect my, protect my services. That's pretty cool. So metrics then, to see how your services uh, perform. And I'll just continue using the application I have running so I don't have to restart it all the time. I'll just go here and stop this token stuff. No, let me see, just stop this. There we go, yes, get it off. And let's go and see if this one has some metrics. Okay, okay, this is on uh, a different port. Let's uh, start the Cloud Educ application again, sorry. I guess this video is gonna be screwed up. <laughs> so, there we go. Let's start Cloud Educ. So this is a, the, the simple application, it's just one is a simple endpoint. And I, I haven't uh, really uh, uh, done anything uh, to enable this metrics, but I get it for for free out of it. So if I go in here and it's on 9080 metrics, and you can see I get uh, Prometheus metrics out of it. Uh, and and all the metrics here that are uh, the base metrics are defined by specifications and all vendors have to have them. So it's portable across the implementation. So if I move this one to another microprofile implementation, they will still be there. Uh, they're also uh, possible to add some vendor specific uh, metrics. I'm not sure if they've done it here, but uh, then, then it will be marked with vendor. What I also have is application specific metrics. 
So if I go, just go in here and hit the endpoint, uh, and, and say hello to it, uh, and, and just hit it a couple of times, uh, go back to the metrics, and we'll see uh, if I just filter on the application metrics. You'll see that I now have uh, ap application metrics, and here I've, I've hit the, the endpoint five times. And I, if I go in and, and, uh, and refresh the page, uh, I'll have six. So, so where did this come from? Uh, well, those of you who were observant may have seen that I added this at meter annotation to the endpoint. And this is one way of just adding metrics to my endpoint. I could add, uh, there are several other uh, metrics I can add, and uh, depending on how I want to measure my application, I can s spread these annotations out through my application and get the metrics out in whatever form I, uh, I want. The ones I get here are, are just generators. So I get the, the entire package name and, and the endpoint, so, but, but you can give it names and everything so you can see it exactly as you want. If you want this in, in JSON, you can just say that, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to have it as uh, application JSON. Let's see here. If I just do this, it should be, oh, not this one. There. You, you can get it as JSON if you want that. So, so, so if you're using Prometheus, Prometheus uh, version is, is nice. If you want to have something in JSON, you can do that. So, all right, fault tolerance. So uh, this is the last one I'll, uh, I'll uh, demo before I go and show how the integration with Jakarta EE and, and MicroProfile is. So fault tolerance is a little bit trickier to demo, but I'll do my best. I'm here. I'm actually using Liberty here as well. I don't need to, but I don't know why all these demos are using that. But let me see. I have a tolerant duke. And what I've done here is that I have a simple, it's the same super simple hello endpoint. But in this case, I've annotated it with uh, some, some fault tolerance uh, annotations. And what I say here, first of all, I give it a timeout. So, so I, I say that this service, if it doesn't respond within uh, three seconds, I want it to time out. So if it's a long, long run service, I never want this to be uh, more than, than uh, three seconds, and then a timeout exception should, should occur. Then I add a circuit breaker and say that if I have three timeouts in a row, then it should wait 10 seconds before accepting any more traffic. And that's the delay of, of 10 at, at the beginning here. So, so it, 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 it just annotates your method. And this, in this case, I'm annotating the REST endpoint, which is maybe not something you would do. You'd probably do it on, on the client side of things, uh, calling the other services. But, but uh, this is just for demo purposes. So, so this makes sense here. So what I'm doing here to provoke this to happen is that I'm just having a counter, and I'm saying that if I have a, a uh, the, the first three times this endpoint is hit, I'm just going to delay for 10 seconds. So I'm sure that it's more than three seconds, so it, it would delay, but after three seconds, it should respond with a, a timeout exception. But since I don't want this timeout ex exception to be visible to the client, I'm adding a fallback to it. So, uh, and, 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 and a fallback handler that just says, hey, I can't count. So when I hit this one, it will wait for 10 seconds, but after three, it will say, hey, I can't count. The three first attempts. The fourth will wait 10 seconds, and then it will answer. Okay? So if I start this one, Uh, I have to go to tolerant tick. Alright, did not build it. Yeah. 
while it's building, I'll just go and prepare my my browser. So, so now we should be able to run it. Oh, I built it on Thorntail. Okay. Uh, I wonder if that will work. Let's let's run it in Thorntail. Let's go. Okay, now I'm on thin ice here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, to test this one, I want four uh, endpoints. So this one should be on 8080. Hello, I guess. There we go. There we go, like this. Let's see, is it up and running? Yes, it's ready. So let's start it. It should wait for three seconds before doing something. And there we say, after three seconds, it says, uh, I can't count. And this one should, should just be, okay, the fourth one. Uh, sh should be waiting for 10 seconds, but I wasn't fast enough. And then it just c continued counting because now it's the, the circuit breaker has gone past. It's kind of a hard demo. You have to play around with it, but it's, it's kind of cool to do. So, as I, as I mentioned, configuration for MicroProfile 1.0 uh, uses the, the system properties if they are there the environment variables if they are there. Otherwise, it will look into the application and use some configuration file. And the configuration file is useful for uh, you as a developer in your IDE when you do the development local, lo locally. And then you can set the environment variables in your Docker container, for example, or, or, or use system properties, uh, or both mix them uh, in your Kubernetes or whatever cloud environment or local uh, where you deploy them. If this isn't good enough, then just create your own config source. And I know several providers have their own config sources. I know that, for example, Microsoft have a, a config source for their secure uh, vault in Azure. So if you want to have your password securely stored and running on Azure, you can just use the, the Microsoft provided uh, config source to get your properties secure there. And, and there are other uh, similar out there. Before we go to summary, I'll uh, go in and show uh, how the Jakarta E uh, plays around with uh, MicroProfile. So, I created a similarly simple Jakarta E hello application, and it just says, do Excel hello. What I've done here is I've added configuration. And this is not a part of 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Jakarta E yet. And and I'll just remove the this one. So the only the, the POM file here is super simple. The only thing I have here is a provided dependency for MicroProfile. So what I will do now is just to to build a thin war, a Java E war. And, and just uh, drop it into a uh, application server, uh, Java E application server, and, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll use two different ones, and you can see that they already support config for, for this uh, um, this uh, uh, message I'm, I'm, I'm writing, because I, I do have this. I'm saying hello, but I'll override that in the application server. So just build this one. And, and the, the, the advantage of, of Java EE and Thin Wars is that they build fast. So what I'll do now is to pick uh, a application server here, and this one is uh, Wildfly 14, which supports Java EE 8, and also parts of uh, MicroProfile. So uh, what I'll do here is to, uh, not this one, I'll Go in here, just copy the war I created here. Oh, sorry. There we go. Copy. 
basically. Yeah? I'll, I'll just first I'll, I'll start the application server. Okay, just it, it's going. And then I'll uh, go into my other window, which I thought I had here, there. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing everything manual here. Usually we do, do, do it differently, but uh, now I'll just copy the, the war file into the deployments folder. Jakarta. Uh, War here, oh sorry, uh, like this, and uh, the the uh, server should uh, pick this up, deploy this application in, and, uh, and I should be able to to uh, run it. I'll just find a better browser. Okay, let's take this one. Full screen. So localhost. It, 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 hello, it says do says hello. And if I want to configure this and show that config actually works with Wildfire 14, that is just download and unzip and, and start it, I'll just stop the server here and I'll, I'll export. Sorry, I'll, I'll put it on top of the screen. So I'll just export message uh, is high. So this is, so I'll just use this as an environment variable. And then and I'll, I'll uh, restart the application server. I'm not sure what these re uh, red messages means, but it did say something here. It is. Sorry. Okay, that's me stupid trying something new. Let's, uh, can I just stop it? Let's see. And one, how do I stop uh, stop this service? I should just um, kill the process. I'm not sure if it is. It should be okay. No. 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 I, I should be able to just give it another port, shouldn't I? Something like this. Uh, let, let's uh, hold that thought. I'll, I'll um, maybe it's J boss. Oh, sorry, Gert. <laughs> Thank you. And then Wildfly, I guess. Yes. Kill minus nine is eighteen two five two. Now it should be okay, right? Yes. And we are up and running, and now it says hi. So you can see by just running a regular Wildfly, I can, I can uh, hook into MicroProfile Config. So it's already there with, with my Java E uh, code. So just to, to prove the, uh, and, and show how we can combine a little bit with, with Java E, I'll, I'll just keep the applications running. Uh, I'll go in here, and I'll, I'll add some Java E 8 stuff to my application. And I'll do it super simple. I'll just add a, a query param here, which I called email, string email. But this is Java 7, so I haven't added anything new. So let's add some, some stuff that came in E8. And I know that, the, OK, to get that, I need to, uh, to go in my POM and add the, add the uh, Java 8 dependency. So let's go there. Let's go. Java 8 API version 8. And this one is 
as always, should be provided like this. Then I can go back in my, my application and use some uh, Java E8 specific stuff, like the new e add email bean validation. So, so now I'm saying that this has to be a valid email address. So if I now just build this application, sorry, okay, there. Just build my application. Now I'm using Java E8. Uh, very simple little piece of it, but still. Uh, I go in here and I drop the, the WAR file into Wildfly again. It should uh, directly redeploy it. And uh, we should be able to, to go in here and say that email is Duke. And it should say, hey, it, it's not a well-formed email address. So you see, bean validation is hooking in and working, uh, as you would uh, suspect. And if I say that do get DevOps, be, it should be OK. So as you see, for, for um, uh, microprofile, to work together with uh, with uh, uh, Jakarta E or J uh, Java E in this case, uh, just add the you need the Java E dependency for for the Java E application, and then you need the microprofile dependency for the microprofile stuff. While this is true, this is kind of a dangerous because it's not necessary that I've implemented all of this. So a safer way here would be to just add the config microprofile specification and not the entire API. Uh, so that you need to read the vendor's documentation and see what uh, what they support. So if, if I, uh, for example, I don't think that Wildfly supports the health check yet. Yeah, so it doesn't doesn't work there. So, but if I go in and and just take my war and and drop it into, uh, for example, uh, Open Liberty, it it should be um, uh, working. Fine, there, excuse me. Uh, bin. Yes, sir. So I'll just drop the war here. Oh, no, that was not the same one. Uh, let me see. Do I have it in the. <laughs> This one. So I just take the the Jakari war and and drop that one into Open Liberty. There and go and start it. So so here I have a Java E8 application with some microprofile stuff. Uh, just moving it over to another application server, and it's on 9080, not 8080. Hello. Uh, it said Duke says hi, so you see the configuration works. Uh, Open Liberty, as you probably have guessed, also still uh, support the, the health check and metrics and, and all of the others. So, so w which will work for uh, uh, Java E8 applications as well. So to sum up, uh, if you're on a Java E 7 kind of base version of, of your microprofile implementation, then microprofile 104 is the current version. Uh, if you're, uh, and, and then the, the dependency you add there is the uh, 104 uh, POM as a provided dependency. If you are on Java E8, then the latest version of microprofile is 2.1. You just need to check which version do the vendor implement and, and choose accordingly. And, and uh, there you have a lot of more support for uh, microservices. And the, the version 2 track is, is the one continuing now based on Java E8. And here you use the version as 2.1. The other thing is just the same. Future. Microprofile 2.2 is planned for February-ish, 
And here, uh, the, you see the new stuff here. Is, uh, the blue ones are updated versions of the existing APIs. And the one on top, the reactive support, is, is um, uh, new specifications that are up and coming. This is a roadmap. It's not definitive. So uh, keep a lookout. It could be this. It could be something else. But uh, it's probably coming something in February. Java E8 is still out there, and the, the servers are coming out. You see, so Open Liberty supports it, uh, Wildfire supports it, Tommy supports it, uh, partially Payara supports it. So, so Java E8 is where you, you should move if you haven't done it yet, if you're on E7 right now. So E8 is definitely it's a lot of cool stuff uh, going on there. Eclipse Enterprise for Java, E for J is uh, where all these technologies are being developed right now under the Jakarta E. Uh, projects. So if you want to join the EE4J uh, or, or contribute to some of the projects uh, like the specifications or the implementations, this is where you start. Go in, search for EE4J or Eclipse Enterprise to Java, find the email list, join the list, join the discussion and uh, help us develop this. Jakarta.ee is a website for Jakarta EE. Uh, this is where we all we also post all all documentation for the, the specifications that are Jakarta E uh, up here. This is also where you find information. We have uh, on the bottom of the page, there is also uh, all conference appearances where we have Jakarta E stuff. Uh, and, and you can see all the, the, the members being part of it. And all the minutes from our meetings, everything is there. And we have this nice. Uh, uh, logo type, Jakarta E. I have stickers there for, for, for Jakarta E, so just come down here afterwards. Some resources. Uh, I'll post the slides afterwards, so, but uh, microfold.io. Uh, Open Liberty has a lot of guides up there for uh, how to get started with the different specifications. Uh, the Eclipse Microprofile project at Eclipse Foundation. Uh, the mailing list at uh, the Google Groups, uh, and, and of course, uh, everything else on GitHub. Uh, Jakarta E has the Jakarta E site. We have the uh, uh, E4J project at Eclipse. The samples I've shown here today is on my GitHub, uh, and uh, also have uh, a, a, a bit more ex ex samples there, so just look at my GitHub and do whatever you want with it. Maybe not run any production, you see, it's, it's kind of shaky, some of them. So. Um, That was what we had, and we have a buff. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, I'm working here. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to point this out. Um, we were looking, we have a buff on Wednesday night to talk about Jakarta EE. It also overran with an IBM event that we have on Wednesday evening. So what we have done is we've kind of combined the two. So I think Stefan's going to be updating the schedule, but in the meantime, I want you to be aware that the Jakarta EE boff on Wednesday night is actually moving to Kelly's Irish Pub. There's the URL there, ibm.biz, Jakarta EE boff. We would like to just kind of get an idea of how many people are coming for the boff. We will have a separate area of the bar marked off. They're going to have a flag, a banner for the boff. Um, but this way we get free beer, free food, and you know, you are all welcome. The other thing, I don't have a pretty picture like this, but um, there's also a boff tonight on micro profile. Now this one is here. I think it's in boff room number two. Um, and that's from eight until nine o'clock uh, tonight. So we've got one on micro profile tonight. The Jakarta EE one will be Wednesday night, and we're going to have it at Kelly's Irish Pub. That's down near um, the Central Train Station, if any of you are staying down there. Okay? Um, so just wanted to make sure everyone knew about that. And I, anything else? Remember to oh. vote for us. Yes. Yeah. So, so we don't, you know, we don't have the full three hours. So I guess we're giving you an hour back, but we are open for questions. Uh, you can either, you know, raise your hand here or come down to the table. And we have three T-shirts. <laughs> so, so three questions. The question could be, can I have a T-shirt? You know. <laughs> <laughs>
He also yeah. had one. Support for events. That is something that we're looking at as part of the, of the reactive work. Um, so the reactive messaging is also being looked at. You know, JAXRS has some of that kind of built in with the server sent events, and we're looking at how does that tie into the reactive programming model. So all of that, yes, is being discussed as part of the microprofile effort. Um, we don't have a final answer there yet, but that's what the teams are working on. If you're thinking about internal events in your application, you all are already have the CDI events. Yeah, so okay. Yes, okay. Yes. yes. Uh, can you repeat it, please? Yes. Okay, so how are the metric stores? I think they are just live as long as you're running the application, and if you want to persist them, you have to consume them somehow uh, by, for example, Prometheus. I guess, I guess that's yep. correct. Yeah. Yep, that, that's accurate. Yes. Okay, so the question is, can I use an external config source? And the answer is yes, you can uh, provide your own. It's a simple interface to, to uh, implement. And, and you can give it any priority so it hooks in before or after the default ones. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so he's asking about how to get started with Java EE, Microprofile, Jakarta EE. Um, I'm going to be a little bit biased, but uh, Ivar did mention it also. On openliberty.io, we have some guides out there, and the guides are all standalone for learning aspects of either Microprofile or Java EE, which eventually will be Jakarta EE. And all the guides are standalone, so if you want to learn just about config, that's what the guide will take you through. If you want to learn about you know, some aspect, let's say CDI, that's what it'll take you through. And you don't have to build it up and have a big, gigantic a application. It's all confined to one topic. So that's my viewpoint of how to get started. I don't know if you have anything else. Yeah, no, that's about it, yeah. Okay, good. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. We'll see you through the rest of the week. Thank you.